Καλησπέρα σα. Είμαι ο Τάκη Καρκάνα, διευθυντή του Αργοστηρίου Αρχαιολογικών Επιστημών Μάρκομ Βίνερ τη Αμερικανική Σχολή Κλασικών Σπουδών στην Αθήνα και σα καλωσορίζω στην ετήσια διάλεξη του εργαστηρίου μα. Ε, θα συνεχίσω στα αγγλικά για να προλογίσω και τον ομιλητή μα. Good evening and thank you all for coming in the annual lecture of the Malcolm H. Winner Laboratory for Archaeological Science of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. My name is Takis Karkanas and I'm the director of the Winner Lab. I'm very honored today and particularly happy to introduce our speaker, one of the leading scholars in his field, Yorgos Papayuanu. Yorgos Papayuanu is uh, currently an associate professor at the Department of Informatics of the Athens University of uh, Economics and Business. He received his PhD degree in computer graphics and shape analysis in 2001 from the National and Cambodian University of Athens. And from 2002 to, to 2007, he has worked as a virtual reality software engineer at the foundation of the Hellenic World. And from 2006 till 2010, he was a lecturer at the Department of Informatics of the University of Economics and Business, and then an assistant professor till 2021. The research of Georgos Papayuanu is focused on real-time computer graphics algorithms, photorealistic rendering, and three-dimensional shape analysis. He has published more than 1990 scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals, international journals and conference proceedings, and book chapters, and has co-authored three computer graphics textbooks. In addition, he has participated in more than 30 research and develop, development projects funded by the European Union and Greek University research grants, as well as private sector as a researcher, developer, and principal investigator. A relevant example is the European project Precious, which developed geometric augmentation technologies for predictive digitization, restoration, and degradation assessment of cultural heritage objects. Papayano is the lead, is the head of the computer graphics group, a part of the information processing laboratory research unit in Athens University of Economics and Business. Uh, and its members conduct research on key areas related to image synthesis and shape analysis with an emphasis on real-time and interactive application. Papayuan is also a member of several professional associations and program committees of many conferences, all in the field of computer graphics and 3D shape processing. Tonight, Papayuano will present applications of visual computing methods to the restoration of archaeological projects, uh, sorry, artifacts, and the potential this provides in the digital transformation of the process. We all know that fragmentation of artifacts is one of the major problems that archaeologists face in the field and in the lab, and it concerns all types of archaeological materials, from large monuments to small objects. Therefore, solving the problem of restoration is very important to archaeological interpretation, and digital tools are potentially a great solution, something that Opaiwano will talk about today. Thank you. Yours. The podium is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have nothing left to say about myself. <laughs> Dr. Karkanas told everything there is. Um, so I'm um, really uh, honored to be here and uh, grateful, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank the American uh, School of Archaeological <coughs> Classical Studies, and especially um, Dr. Karkanas and Dr. Mikhailidis, who invited me here for this talk and arranged all the details of this, uh, today's uh, meeting. So. Um, the discussion is about digital restoration, not just restoration, I'm not an expert, you are. So I'm going to delve into certain perspectives of how to use, how to uh, employ techniques, computational techniques for assisting the process, not entirely transform it into a virtual thing because we all know, you know better, that it's not the target. We want to become better, not 
replace something that works. So a brief overview of what we're going to discuss today is, first of all, why go digital? Is it necessary? Is it useful? Okay. And in this perspective, what is the role of a digital surrogate? Because surrogates, digital surrogates, uh, we're, um, we think of them as a very detailed versions of digital versions of things that we can study, work with. But is, it that, is that the requirement for digital restoration? We have to see. Um, and this obviously affects the way we digitize stuff. Also, then we're going into the, some details about the digital restoration pipeline, what this entails, and more specifically about computational reassembly tasks and digital shape recovery completion prediction. Um, to put all these things in a more futuristic perspective, it is essential for us to discuss why all these are useful, how are we going to make them practical, are they now practical? How, what problems there are to solve, and therefore, what is the roadmap for us to take for the next steps in the forthcoming years. So, first of all, why go digital? The obvious reason is that we can transcend the physical barriers of our own world. So, um, we can work effortlessly, effortlessly with uh, hard to manipulate or fragile objects, delicate objects, delicate material. We can um, experiment without fear of damaging them. And obviously, by transcending the physical limitations, we can uh, completely discard laws of physics. So we can have penetrating overlapping pieces uh, floating in thin air. So it's very useful for testing hypotheses, very useful for displaying and explaining different hypotheses. So um, working on a virtual space has some clear advantages actually for demonstration or experimentation. However, it has another advantage which has to do with the physical world. So it's really hard to imagine taking away one building block from this <laughs> assembly and okay, testing it with, with another without a crane. So yes, we can do that easily on a virtual environment. Another thing is that a digital process, a digital metaphor for um, doing the assembly and all the uh, restoration is that we can never go wrong. We can actually test multiple hypotheses, we can undo the process because it's non-invasive, non-destructive and actually non-existing, it's only virtual. So uh, it's useful because it doesn't damage the artifacts. Sorry. Another thing is that we can go beyond the ability, the capacity of the human visual system, the human brain, to process the tangible and the intangible, um, because we can computationally perform comparisons, computations, measurements at the level and scale that is impossible for us to, to do. Uh, we humans are not good at absolute measurements. We are good at comparing things. We're good at approximating things, but Measuring detailed stuff, no, this is not our trade. Um, so, for example, here with a meteorological scanner, we could take samples, yearly samples, uh, in a yearly interval in between those scans, and measure at the LFC's archaeological site certain points, certain areas on this column where deteriora deterioration was more intense. And you all know that marble is a very resilient material to work with and doesn't erode that much. So uh, you have to be precise and have very accurate measurements that are impossible by hand, actually. Availability and access is another thing that is characteristic to virtual environments. So we can access remote resources. And remote resources might be something that some institution has and I don't, and we can share. Or a repository where things are centralized and assets like uh, fragments, digitized fragments, exist and I can download them, test them, public or regulated, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that I can access those collections uh, remotely. So I don't have to be there and I can combine remote resources. 
And obviously, I can measure things that are impractical or impossible in reality. For instance, I could not take a line, a linear tape, and measure the diagonal of this thing here. Or I could never possibly quantify the contact area between two pieces. So, OK, I can qualitatively assess that the, the approximate area of overlap is this, or I can uh, use the similar technique as dentists do to imprint the contact points on a uh, thin film. But all these are very approximate. Without using that and going to the virtual environment, you can actually do precise computations. It, it sounds illogical in the sense that if I have the real thing, I can do real measurements, yes, but you cannot go into that contact surface and do any measurements at all. So in a virtual space, you can. So it enables us to do things that otherwise would be impossible. And visualization, obviously, is a, has a major role to play because I cannot, for instance, see the contact surface between the two physical objects, but if I make a tra one transparent in a virtual environment, I can see through that and observe what happens at the contact surface. Obviously, I can discard the natural correlation of the surface and go into more, um, I wouldn't say psychedelic, it's actually the curvature of the surface here that's visualized, and I can detect salient features on both surfaces, complementary, curvature that can be used, can assist me in determining whether two pieces can be aligned together. So visualization is another aspect of going virtual. Obviously, when you are in a virtual space, you can easily uh, distribute your content, you can easily share your content, and you can easily educate people with that content. Because it's easy to experience the same thing that some expert uh, does on the restoration process. Um, we can share views, we can share experiences, and we can also communicate. So it's easier, it's more natural, and we are actually used to that nowadays. So a word about digital surrogates. If I take the definition of a, di a digital surrogate, I would say that it is a digital aspect, a digital version, of an object that has the closest possible fidelity to the actual object. Uh, and this means that I can derive theoretical representations and I can theorize, I can uh, estimate th things on that object, on the computational world. Um, however, this means that the digital circuit should enable us to preserve something by remediation. So we move from the physical world into the virtual digital asset and therefore access it, and eventually have the possibility of processing this model to infer information from that. Well, to be honest, for the digital restoration, not everything is that important. For instance, well, I don't need the closest possible fidelity to reality to enable somebody to do digital restoration. Fidelity is good for preservation by remediation, but it's not necessary for a computing system to perform an analysis. We need a medium scale detail and not the highest possible scale. And to make things more interesting, for the restoration process, not every aspect and not every part of a surface is that important. We know and we can understand easily that fracture surfaces are important because they come in contact with another fragment, yes. Um, there are salient features on the surface, on the external surfaces, on the intact surfaces, that can use and determine possible alignments and correlations between pieces. Yes, but the rest, well, it's noise. Practically, it's noise. N nobody uses them. You don't use them. I don't use them. So uh, why bother? Okay, so, um, so we have to put some water in our glass of wine and say, okay, I can step back and consider whether there's a more viable, more fast option to digitize things that are, th this way is compatible with the task at hand, which is restoration, not preservation, okay? Um, and human perception actually is irrelevant here. I don't want to look at the piece and admire it, uh, or I'm not going to deduce things by visually inspecting uh, the surface. Inspecting the real thing is better, okay? so. 
we want to digitize in, or, in order to enable a computational system to work. To do that, nowadays what we do is take a high resolution scan, usually higher than that, and save it for representation and remediation of the uh, original object, and then go and simplify it at a reasonable quality level so that an algorithm can pick up the details and work geometric algorithms to compare surfaces. That is good and appropriate. And obviously I can go even further and simplify stuff uh, so that I can visualize them more effectively, more efficiently, and probably I'm going to transfer some of the details present on the medium scale or high scale um, representation into that version so that I can make the object look more interesting. Uh, we have done something like that uh, with uh, Dr. Mikhail Levis uh, in a project for uh, visualizing bone fragments and bone, <coughs> a bone collection. And yes, if you are going to visualize stuff, you don't want them to be very high detail because it's impossible to uh, handle all that information. So the digital restoration pipeline is something we call a pipeline for you is a process and an entire th thematic area of research. But okay, I call it pipeline because I'm thinking about an algorithm to map to that process, which eventually comes into a rough pipeline. So the digital restoration is a very, very broad term and it encompasses many things that <coughs> I can't even hardly talk about today. However, if we want to focus on geometric algorithms or, or geometric tasks about restoration, we can roughly uh, slice down all this uh, broad area into specific tasks like fresco restoration, which resembles 2D puzzling in some way. It's a flat presentation and flat parameterization. Um, there's also um, an extruded version of that like uh, it is a form of this uh, which is, you know, it's a, t a large tiled map. Um, and this can be considered also a two-dimensional case because it's constrained on the floor, on the plane. However, all the tiles, all the fragments, all the parts here are three-dimensional because they have some uh, specific volume and there's a contact area, not a contact line between them. Um, there's also pottery restoration, which is very essential task. It's very important because we have too many pulsars. Um, this is a well-defined problem computationally, obviously also uh, manually, because it's a constrained symmetrical uh, surface of revolution that comes out of, as a result. And we we'll also have and consider that uh, all the fragments of the pulsars are thin, usually. So um, this is a line-to-line -line matching uh, algorithm that is involved. Um, going to measure in the statutory restoration, well, this is far more complicated because we have no assumption about symmetry. These are fully three-dimensional objects, which means six degrees of freedom for every part. And so we have arbitrary shapes that we are going to use, and things can get complicated there. We can complicate things further if we're talking about bone or wooden Fragment, fragments or artifacts, because there we have bending, we have extreme erosion, we have uh, chipping, we have flexing, we have everything that can be done on them. So attempting to working on this is really, really tricky. Um, in general, we're going to focus as a talk on the three-dimensional case, but if I'm going to interject things about two-dimensional constraint Restoration, it's important, and it's actually part of the same uh, notion of the pipeline. So, roughly speaking, a digital restoration pipeline involves those four stages, three and one optional. So, first of all, we have to digitize stuff. You know that, I know that, and it tends to be one of the most important aspects because I cannot do anything digital without digital assets. So, uh, it's also very time consuming. Um, then I have an important stage that is not so obvious, which is a geometric pre-processing stage. Okay, the digitization is done by the human, and the computer does the geometric processing. 
It can be um, self-contained, step, non-supervised, and it is useful for determining qualities and quantify aspects of the object that can be used later on in the reassembly stage. And now comes the reassembly stage, which takes every piece and every detectable fracture face or line, if we're talking about thin objects, and attempts to geometrically compare them, match them, create a new pose that is optimally um, aligning those pieces together. And it has to do that for all the combinations of available fragments. And then there's a combinatorial stage involved where all these little islands of matched fragments have to be simultaneously optimized and clustered. So this is a hard part, it's a computational heavy part, and this is where computers can assist, obviously. The final stage is about object completion. And this means that I can take whatever I have in terms of a reassembled cluster of fragments and attempt to rectify the shape, to predict the shape that comes out of that. Uh, it's obviously not the case with everything because there are non-symmetrical, non-well-defined uh, shapes that can tell us nothing about the in missing parts. But there are many, many cases where we can work with symmetries and where we can work and we determine things with priors, geometric priors, we can determine from the fragments, from the postures, from what we have in our hands. And why is that stage important? It is because we can actually 3D print or go back to the physical world and produce something that is usable, like a prosthetic part, and therefore we can not only stay in the virtual domain, but go back to the real life domain. In terms of data, the pipeline is quite simple. Uh, it takes a physical object, we digitize it, we get a digital geometry representation, could be a volumetric representation, could be a surface point, uh, a surface representation, point cloud representation, whatever form. And it requires sample processing to clean it up, to remove and simplify the geometry, and actually to segment it. So we have to detect and annotate usable surfaces, surface patches on the geometry that correspond to potentially fractured surfaces. I'm keeping the word potentially because we are not conservative about this. This stage serves as a filter to reduce the computational complexity of the following stages, to reduce the search space for potential solutions, and why, this is why it's very important. And also to reduce, to remove trivial cases. So you, we all know that if you, you give me two flat external surfaces, I can easily match them together, and this is a perfect match. But this is an undesirable match. Okay, so we have to eliminate these kind of um, false positives. Um, <clears throat> the multi-part assembly is a stage that can run automatically or semi-automatically or incrementally guided by the user. And what it does is create geometric transformations, poses for those objects that make them uh, attached one to one another in an assembly. And that makes sense. It's important. And then we can measure and render and visualize and produce beautiful images out of them or go to the next stage and go back to the physical world by 3D printing the object or what is missing or the entire thing. The challenges about the computational version of digitization is obviously robustness. Um, an algorithm is very hard to be robust about something that we are uncertain of. So robustness in this domain is quite tricky. Um, generality is another issue because you cannot face all the problems with a single algorithm. Okay, it's a different technique to solve a puzzling problem, for, to uh, reconstruct a pot, and a different thing to work on uh, masonry fragments. Uh, so uh, there are specialized algorithms that work better for each one of these cases. Tolerance to heavy damage, erosion, chip flaked surfaces, this is very important because that's what we have. So uh, we don't have clean cut surfaces, it's illogical, uh, it's not realistic. So every algorithm we employ has to be able to, uh, to be resilient to some amount of noise, 
scanning noise, natural damage noise, and obviously missing parts, because nothing is perfect. Um, also, the absence of usable feature, because sometimes even the fracture lines or the fracture surfaces are featureless. Um, obviously, parts of the external surfaces are also featureless and are therefore unusable. Um, all that has to be efficient, because we have vast amounts of data. Even a single fragment scan may be at many uh, megabytes or more of data, and this means that we have to be very conservative of how we process them and how we use them in a reassembly pipeline. And the problem scales very badly. So in um, computational complexity wording, this is an n squared complexity. What does that mean? It means that if I have n fragments scanned in my repository, it usually takes n squared computations to happen in order to be able to have a nice uh, result as an output, which is, OK, uh, hard. If n goes to 1,000, I need 1 million combinations to be tested and compared for something useful. Um, what I have not forgotten, but this is not placed last because it's uh, to be neglected, is actually because it's very important, is that the expert user has to be kept, not kept, but be in control of all this process. And this is something we often neglect as computer scientists. So this is very important, and we have to pay more attention to that. Um, the fragmentary material can be categorized in computational terms. Uh, I am sure you're not using the same taxonomy. Um, we have to distinguish between thin and thick objects because we compare different things. For thin objects, we like frescoes or potsherds, we usually compare fractured lines, whereas for more bulky objects, we use the contact surface. Different computations, different distances, different ways to compare the two fragments. Um, symmetrical and non-symmetrical objects are very, a very clear and meaningful distinction because a non-symmetrical object has full six degrees of freedom to move and rotate, whereas a constrained motion gives us less parameters to optimize and therefore it's easier to solve. If I have an object that is featureless, like these columns on the bottom, well, the external surface is featureless, well, I cannot rely on that information for anything and therefore it gives me no external clue. Whereas if I have salient lines or I have a repeatable pattern, chisel marks, all these are very useful because they produce anchor points for any uh, possible reassembly. Ideally, in a computational world, we see um, a pile of rubble and try to make some clustering out of it geometrically. So this is a very rough sketch of what an algorithm would like to have. Well, reality is a bit more perplexing, though, because we have bulks and tons of material. We have to first digitize them and do some pre-clustering and categorize the objects and then try to computationally help ourselves do something useful out of them. Um, so it's, it's a hard problem. Okay. So what are the st potential strategies for tackling that problem? Um, usually it depends on the dimensionality of the problem. So for two, dimensionals, uh, two dimensions, we compare contours and segment possibly the outline of uh, fragments. And then we compare them segment-wise or, or all together. And we use color extensively because it's a useful information, especially when, when you're doing frescoes and potential feature lines on the um, surface of the object. Uh, however, when we go to three-dimensional cases, well, if we're unlucky, we go for full six degrees of freedom and a general solver that has no meaningful way to constrain the problem. However, there are cases like uh, when you have thick fresco fragments where we have this ribbon style a contact surface that can be very constrained, very useful, and it's also the two-dimensional problem. And obviously symmetrical objects like uh, objects of revolution are very handy um, to work with in a two-dimensional constrained way. So it's the uh, axial revolution and the movement up and down the axis. So how am I going to digitally solve a restoration task? Let's start by hierarchically building up 
on the amount of uh, degree of computational automation. So the first thing that one would do is just provide a virtual workspace. So I have my digitized, digitized fragments, I have uh, 3D modeling software like 3 Studio Max here, and I can import my fragments and I can operate on them to manipulate them into a useful pose and probably visualize them, compare them, store them, and uh, distribute them. This is very nice, but it's a very awkward process. It's very hard to be precise because these tools are not made for precise manipulation at that level. Uh, you have no way of um, precisely aligning the contact surfaces, those irregular contact surfaces, and those programs are made for um, compiling a virtual set, a virtual scene. So it's not the task they're made of, made for. Okay. Um, and to make things worse, all the gizmos and gadgets that are used for manipulating the objects are not that intuitive when you have been accustomed to working with your hands. So, well, it's not very compatible to the task. If we want to go um, one degree further, we could add some functionality to snap the pieces together. So, we still retain all this manual placement of pieces together into one assembly or matching two fragments, but we also add some functionality to lock the pieces together more precisely. So we're using a local search algorithm to find the best candidate pose to interlock the pieces together. So this snapping can be actually useful. Going further, we can exploit landmarks on the surfaces like those, which has um, engraved uh, lines on the uh, form of Orbisomia. And I can either manually or semi-automatically or completely automatically detect them. I can also use any salient feature on the external surfaces to extend it, extrude it, to, uh, so that it creates some support on void space. And by using all these uh, little lines, I can optimize both the number of interlocking uh, segments and the amount of geometric uh, contact they have in 3D space. And therefore, I can end up with some meaningful results that solve a, separate, a certain very specific problem here, that the pieces are not necessarily in contact with one another. Okay, so imagining their continuation in space uh, without having to actually one uh, be in contact with the other is very important when you have missing pieces. And obviously I can go fully into a three-dimensional automatic envir automated environment. This is something we have attempted in the past in this previous project um, to provide automatic clustering. Uh, this is a very nice thing to have, but it doesn't scale well. Um, for the reasons I have explained before. This is a non-linear scaling. So if you have a very large search space for arbitrary pieces thrown together and say, okay, do the clustering, this can take a lot of time to complete. Um, <clears throat> so it's very important here that you are able as a user to impose certain constraints in the process to assist it, to help it to minimize the search page. And here comes the important thing, which is the pre-processing. So I start with a fragment and then I can computationally, statistically actually, <coughs> evaluate the surface to determine parts of that, patches of the surface that seem to be more irregular. And by doing so, I can mark them as potentially fractured. And I can be, uh, I can accept false positives here. I don't mind. I can, for instance, detect as a fractured line this rim, this, um, the, the downward part of this fragment, which is fine. Um, the registration algorithm won't find a match for that, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but it's nice that I have completely removed out of the equation all these smooth surfaces that are never going to be used for contact surface matching. Uh, I can also detect features, usable geometric quantities on the surface that can guide an algorithm, or I can even go further and cluster those features in meaningful areas, meaningful patches that can help me or the algorithm uh, glue together those pieces more efficiently. So here's a small demonstration. I hope it works. 
Mm, no, it doesn't. Oh, it does. So this is a tool we use for that stage. It can clearly be done automatically. Here you can see um, a speculation of the roughness of the surface and an estimation of the roughness. And based on that, I can segment the, the, the surface into patches and then annotate them automatically, statistically, um, based on this roughness measure. However, here I want to be more uh, less constrained. I want to include another surface into the, the potentially fractured set. And this can be done easily by just sliding, um, lowering this threshold and exporting. Obviously, this thing can be automatically, automatically done completely. I don't have to intervene. But this is done here for demonstration purposes, mostly. Um, after I'm done with this facet extraction and classification, then I can do one of two things. First version, go preemptive and take every fragment with every facet of this fragment available to me and every other facet of every other fragment in my collection and start computing geometric possibilities to glue them together. That can be done offline, obviously, and because it takes some time. And once I'm done with that stage, which is actually computationally heavy, I'm free to very easily um, do this final multipart reassembly. Because once I have the pairwise clustering ready, then uh, all the combinatorial solution to the, my puzzle can be run very quickly. Um, this is a global optimization technique because all the available configurations are available to me, and then I can go and find all the suitable clusters of fragments and maybe impose my own constraints and reevaluate in real time, or okay, nearly real time. So this is a view of this tool we've used. Um, this is a small collection of five fragments. We just import them all into the workspace, lay them on the floor, and say, OK, Pick all of them, all five fragments, and start reassembly. You will notice that in real time, the time is very, very short. Why? Because I have done nothing to geometrically compare those fragments now. This has been done before once I have a fragment enter my collection. However, obviously, this can be very uh, expensive. You have many, many fragments. Instead, you can go to another option and do this incrementally. So, after you run through the same pre-processing stages, you're starting building up a model incrementally, piece by piece, and you're doing the pairwise alignment there at the time of your uh, stitching of, uh, of the cluster. So this will take some time to complete per fragment as you work, but if you're not interested in finding the globally optimal perfect alignment of one fragment to your cluster or to another fragment, but you're sufficiently doing some manual work and then there's a snapping mechanism to help you with the task, this can be run actually in real time. So um, the first version, which is this bulky, um, monolithic, let's say, computation, um, has the user work on two key points of the loop of the entire pipeline to provide constraints, to set up the um, environment, let's say, of the restoration. Then we have the computational algorithm run in isolation, and we get some recommendations back, which can be filtered through new constraints, and we go again and again and again until we have something that is satisfactory. However, if you allow the user to manipulate fragments on the run as it, the process evolves, things can become more interesting and more responsive. So we are in control of the process. So I'm saying this is the future version because no available tool now is doing this. We are trying to, to do it. So um, we want to make it interactive, completely interactive. So you start by providing some uh, constraints, obviously. Um, but as you manipulate, you see this uh, construction, this cluster evolve. Uh, so this involves some anytime computation. Anytime computation is something that runs can be interrupted at any time and pick up the results that you are affecting in the experiment and continue from that. So um, 
you're doing some integrity checks, like you don't want the pieces to penetrate each other. And after you're done, you can adjust everything, fine tune your construction, and you're over. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that once you have two fragments and you have a snapping mechanism, you can run it real time and you can affect the, the object placement in real time and then it will snap into place. So you can evolve and be assisted, evolve the, the assembly and be assisted continuously. This continuous help, I think, is more important than having a remote or monolithic recommendation system, which is something you cannot touch. Okay, so I believe this is the way to do things, and now we have the processing power to, to enable that. Um, what about shape prediction and prosthesis? Well, why? First of all, it's nice to be able to communicate something and visualize something that is complete, or a version of the object that we think should be uh, when completed. Um, but it's very important to note that we can use a complete, a, an estimate of the complete surface to guide the restoration process itself. So if I have certain fragments, and I know this is an object of revolution, I can autocomplete the entire surface, and then I can start gluing things on the evolved surface. So this is useful, okay, as a guide. And this guide can be both a visual guide for us or a computational guide for an algorithm to stitch things on that surface. Um, also, it can be useful for quantifying the results, how good I am, how close to an approximate surface I am. And I also can use the complete surface to retrieve similar objects. So once I can have a partial result and I can estimate a rough estimate of this approximate complete shape, I can query an object database for similar objects to help me visualize the intent and the result. And this is helpful as well. Um, obviously, the fourth key element is that I can, using this evolved surface, this predicted surface, I can compute the complementary parts so I can build prosthetics. So how do we do that? Obviously, symmetry is the first candidate. Axial and planar symmetries are very good, very important aspects of an object. We can use them to constrain the motion for construction, for the assembly, and it's actually done. Okay, this is one of the practical aspects of having symmetrical objects. Um, Self-similarities are also useful because not all objects are ideally symmetric, and replicating aspects or parts of the object that can be considered symmetrical or repeated is also useful for a computational algorithm to fill in the gaps. Um, I can also have partial reconstructions of an object or partial scans. This also helps for uh, doing partial scanning and then completing the result. We can take a similar object and do a non-rigid fitting of that surface, of the complete surface, on our partial result and make it look whole or estimate a good uh, approximation of what is missing. Symmetries are good and are not always considered as a symmetrical surface of revolution. Axial revolutions, axial symmetries are very important, but we can also deal with non-axial symmetries like multiple planar symmetries, or here we do something else. We take the reconstructed piece and align it with itself. So we have repeated alignment of the original reconstructed, reassembled parts to fill in the gaps by rotating the reconstructed object. Obviously, we know this is a, uh, has a dual planar symmetry, and we can do that on purpose. We don't just do it without knowledge. An interesting thing is that when you are working with a complete object, then by subtracting what you already have scanned, you can end up with a complementary piece. Okay, so here this surface A is pre-modeled by somebody who had the fragments and attempted to create with some modeling software a version of the, uh, this plate that best fits the, the surfaces. Uh, it can be computationally optimized to be near perfect. And then you, you can turn all the information to volumetric data, which are very good at um, subtracting 
and uh, computing Boolean operations, as we call them, on these uh, representations. And this is, now we can determine and extract all the rest of the surfaces that are not there, they're not scanned, and actually 3D print them. Here, we, uh, uh, this researcher uses uh, some clear resin to print all the complementary pieces and then glued all the real fragments on the, uh, <coughs> and interlock them on the uh, plate so that it both looks complete and at the same time more ethereal. So it's very clearly to distinguish, clear to distinguish which is our, the part that is being reconstructed, uh, which one is fake, it's made up afterwards. So what are the next steps? Um, clearly, what are the priorities is important to discuss. Okay, um, first of all, we need to make restoration, digital restoration more accept accessible. And to do that, we need to take certain steps. Uh, not only to build computational tools and make them available, this is something we hear and we do for years now, but we have to change a bit our um, strategy. Then we have to eliminate significant bottlenecks. And obviously, we all know that uh, digitization is one of those. To be more user-centric means that we involve the user at every process in a continuous manner, as the one I showed you, and obviously promote collaboration. But this can easily come through the first bullet. Um, something that we don't realize as computer scientists is that we need to eliminate the computing clutter that surrounds the, the, build, the, the things we build. Um, for instance, all this nice virtual environment for restoration have, uh, reassembly have presented you um, in the previous slides. It's very okay, it works, but it has 100 parameters and it's difficult for somebody, even a computer scientist, to tweak and um, optimize all those parameters uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so we, I think it's better if we have more focused, intuitive, simple, compartmentized tools that we can work with. and instead of an all-encompassing large solution. So, accessible. The web is, I think, our prime candidate. Um, if we can build something that runs as a service and we can access it from multiple platforms, I think this is in the right direction. And nowadays, there are certain infrastructures in European infrastructures that I know of, I don't know about other initiatives, that are trying to provide those infrastructures for those means to run things on the web uh, remotely on a clustered service and provide us with uh, algorithms that we can uh, attach to and uh, create meaningful tools. Um, so cloud-based infrastructure is important here. Uh, access from any platform? Yes, obviously. I don't want to carry my laptop everywhere and you don't. As I, as I remember, you're, you want to work with an iPad or something form that is more versatile and easy to carry. Um, open access doesn't necessarily come with the web environment. We have to be open access enabled, not only in terms of how we provide and distribute the software to people that want to use it, but also make the code accessible for people that want to extend it. Because if you provide a core set of functionality for somebody to use, then you can take the code and hire somebody to make it more complex, build a more customizable, customized system for your needs, and this is important. So, extensibility is also an issue here. Uh, digitization is, I think, the prime problem of uh, adopting digitization, digital restoration tactics and techniques. Um, I think we have to go a bit back um, and think about how to methodologically address the problem. It's not a technology. The technology exists. We have very good 3D scanners. We have uh, um, uh, structure for motion. Uh, one thing is that digitization uh, tends to be an issue because it takes a lot of time. So uh, another issue is the system complexity. We don't go big systems. We want flexible, lightweight tools. Um, apprehension against uh, computational techniques in archaeology had been an issue a decade ago. And I'm not really sure if this, this is still a problem. Um, hopefully not. 
Um, so what about this digestion? Now what we do, take a high resolution scan, high precision, we use the best available equipment, and we want a complete scan of an object. Yes, but okay, this can be very slow, actually. Um, what if we could approximate the, for the scan with something more lightweight, with moderate precision and resolution, and if, what if we could cope with partiality? And partiality is not a problem, actually. It, we, we view it as a problem because we're accustomed to working with complete objects because we, want to, we like to view them and inspect them from every angle, but a computational algorithm doesn't necessarily need a complete version of the surface. And if we can do a fast scan and forego some um, completeness, uh, this is a benefit. Um, why? Because we want to go for mass collection digitization. It would be nice if you could lay my fragments on the table, have a sweep of the surface with uh, a scanner or uh, some other technology, and then take all this material, fragment it, segment it, uh, clean it up, and end up with nice usable fragments with no fuss about going in each one of these fragments and painstakingly digitizing it. Um, so for example here, this piece here has these red regions that represent important parts for assembly because these are the contact surfaces. But okay, it, it, the external features, this white surface is nice to have because it carries, it conveys some significant information about this floral pattern. But um, the internal surface of this vase it is not really useful. It has nothing, it's just a flat surface. Why scan it? So I can just lay the piece on my table on the one side and have it scanned on this particular view and I'm done. Why bother with the other side? Um, so it's not about technology, it's about how you scan. What is your notion of scanning something? So it's in a sense, it's a similar thing to photography. When you do some catalog photography, you use a photographer, you have a light setting, and you take a very nice, very representative picture of something. Whereas you can take your mobile phone and take a snap of something. It's for a different purpose, okay. Um, we can leverage on the benefits of structure for motion photogrammetry, which is fast, very available, very cheap, and it does the job not very well, but it can be improved. Um, so we have must invest some time and effort to build post-processing tools that are, work well. Now, the role of AI. AI has riddled our research nowadays. It's everywhere. Uh, we cannot publish a paper without introducing some AI buzzword somewhere in the text. Um, okay, how good is it in our context? Well. For geometric alignment and reassembly tasks and all that, is, that matters uh, when comparing geometries, well, it is approximate. It is a statistically approximate uh, tool that helps us do many wonderful things, but it's not precise. Okay, so procedural techniques and methods, computational procedural techniques, still, I think, not vastly, but outperform uh, deep learning ones. Um, and these deep learning techniques are also very resource intensive. Um, however, we can use AI when it counts and where it has proven itself as a very useful ally. Like retrieval. We can easily and very precisely uh, fetch something from a collection given a geometric exemplar. That's nice. We can compare stuff very easily. Um, we can annotate automatically parts of the geometry or the texture of the geometry. Um, we can autocomplete with geometric transformers a surface to make it whole very well. It works quite nicely. And it can help us with the puzzling or so the combinatorial problem as well, because it's a fuzzy network of pieces that are interlocked in a not precise manner. And this kind of statistical uh, tool can be very useful here as well. Also, we have recently some developments in the use of AI in scanning, so in the representation and acquisition of geometric information, also in the representation of the objects that come after that, because uh, we are used to working with 3D surfaces or volumetric objects, but nowadays we can also talk about 
non-surface representations like nerves, um, neural uh, radiance fields, or uh, Gaussian representations that are just distributions in space. And maybe these can be used for reassembly tasks as well. It's something to be explored. So for, for going into a more user um, compatible way of working in the digital environments, uh, we need, certainly need the user to drive the process, not having standby where, while a computer computes a recommendation. Um, going for general tools instead of specialized ones is a nice thing, and then we can glue them together to make our virtual workspace. And um, we have to uh, let the culture here as expert be creative, not constrained or here. So we have to make the computer do what computer does best and let the catcher heritage expert connect the dots and do the research. So this is very important. So we have to value responsiveness in these computational methods over sophistication to make them simple, usable, and interactive. Um, sharing the experience and the data, obviously, um, is an important thing. Um, restoration is collective. We collaborate to do that. Okay, so this means the virtual version of that has to also be collaborative. So we have to enable a virtual workspace to be shared and to allow multiple experts to work on the same thing. So a version of a digital reassembly tool should look like that. We have the collection, you have multiple users access the same view, operate on the same data, communicate, exchange views, um, ex exchange different interpretations of the object, and this is very important as if you want to make um, the most of a digital pipeline. Obviously, um, we don't wo want to go over the board to have some sort of an imaginary virtual world with virtual avatars, a virtual table, virtual fragments in a virtual space where everything is virtual. Um, no, we don't have to. I, I am actually developing VR applications, and I'm honest about it, it's really tiring to wear a, um, a helmet, okay, or a visor, and look at the world through my uh, tiny lenses here, and after 30 minutes you cannot work anymore. So, no, VR is not the solution here. But there are very handy joysticks that those headsets come with, and these are very uh, nice because there are six degrees of freedom, joysticks and you can actually replicate in the natural motion that when you pick up things and you try to assemble and combine objects in physical space and this is a natural metaphor for a virtual space. So this is a mental note to properly take advantage of them. Um, thank you. Um, I think it's time maybe for questions if you have any. Thank you very much for being here. Giorgo, for this uh, very, I think, helpful presentation. Uh, I can see that there are a lot of restrictions, assumptions, and definitely we will have a lot of questions. Uh, everyone comes from a different field, Obviously. use different <laughs> objects. Uh, so, do you have any questions for Giorgo Sopaiano? Yes, please. So I wonder whether the digital restoration is meant to stay only digital or whether it can be given to architects and archaeologists to reconstruct monuments with already identified identifiable pieces. Thank yes, you. Obviously, once you have um, an identified and uh, pre-assembled uh, set of uh, fragments, then you can obviously scan them as a whole and put them back in the virtual space or recreate them to create a 3D printed version of them that you can combine with other physical objects. So working in a digital world is not a necessity here. 
if you want to avoid the computational complexity and you want to feel the object in your hands, it's very nice to, and you want to avoid destroying something that's very delicate, you can scan it, print it, and then work with a replica, <laughs> obviously. So the transition between those two worlds is easy. easy. It's, it's easy to do uh, given the appropriate equipment, of course, but you can work uh, at scale. You don't have to work on one by one uh, scale, but, and you can do many wonderful things that combine the virtual with the uh, non-virtual <laughs> physical world. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to to add a note, uh, I don't believe that it's useful to go all digital in the sense that there are cases that are easy to solve and natural to solve in the physical environment. It was okay, uh, you can do that. It is there to assist you with cases that are hard to <laughs> to work with, and remote scattered material is one of these cases. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I got a question. Um, in Italy, a group of researchers uh, at the University of Pisa uh, set up an application which um, um, is called Archide, and uh, it, uh, from a picture of uh, um, shared, um, it can uh, propose uh, some uh, um, information about uh, its typology. Mm -hmm. Given this particular field of uh, uh, the virtual um, reconstruction. How far are we from developing uh, an application which using also um, hardware like the Apple LiDAR scans a trace uh, of shards and uh, uh, gives you the information about which yeah. matches which, which? Thank you. Very nice question. Um, actually, it's something we, we have requested funding for. Um, this is a nice thing to have, and I think it's the next uh, step of this evolution. Uh, we want to be able to snap, a f not a photo, but a 3D scan, an approximate scan, as I said, of the piece. And with that limited information of the complete scan, to uh, be able to assess the proper, uh, even approximate alignment, or a good filtering, a good set of candidates with matching with the other pieces. Yes, uh, so this is the intention, actually, to forego the complete scanning pipeline and go with something quick that is available on your mobile phone and be more approachable. Yes, it's a very good idea, and I think <laughs> we all agree on that. <laughs> it's a, the next thing to do. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for this talk. I was wondering about, um, regarding the first stage of the 3D digitization, um, I was wondering about the limitations posed by the different state uh, or accessibility of the object. For example, a collapsed wall in situ that we cannot really move versus movable fragments of architecture that we can arrange on in a storage area. Yeah, uh, a 3D scan of an object is as good as the accessible area. So uh, if it's a collapsed uh, wall over a fresco with limited access, visual access to that surface, well, okay, there's nothing you can do actually. <laughs> you have to dig it out. Um, however, it's helpful, even the case when you have building blocks, because something uh, I'm more uh, familiar with, that uh, have been uh, placed in some war, so they're actually immovable, you can use their external surfaces that are accessible, not the contact surfaces, obviously you don't have access to them, to uh, have, um, um, to take the landmarks and take chisel marks and take uh, even the weathering conditions of s some cases and use them uh, for guiding a, a virtual restoration process only with external surfaces. But this is really hard, actually. Okay. Uh, so if something is glued together or already uh, being built <laughs> with some construction, it's really hard to digitize it properly and have something useful. <clears throat> Uh, 
Hi, thanks for the, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, because you showed a number of examples of um, reconstruction proposals mm -hmm. of pieces sharing no contact points. Sorry? Wait. Of pieces mm -hmm. sharing no contact points yes, yes. Among the, amongst mm -hmm. them. And I was wondering, like, in the physical world, the way of reconstructing things that they share no contact points or no evident contact points is done through a number of different qualities um, that do not apply for in the digital world, whereby the only, let's say, dimension, the only like um, quality we use is the surface topography. Yeah, and, and the assumption of things that may be matched. So yeah. I'm wondering, like, is the digital process changing the uncertainty level of those assumptions? Or is it just the same thing done in a digital world? I believe it's crucial that it remains uncertain. Uh, if you remove this uncertainty, it means that you introduce some uh, prior knowledge that, if existed, would be part of the archaeological work to derive. So. Uh, I cannot guess something uh, that does not pre-exist as a knowledge. I cannot say, for instance, here that this um, incision on the rock, um, this chisel mark, this uh, engraving, the yellow line it should be categorized as a yellow. It, it, rep it represents some, the yellow color represents something here. Uh, and make it a green one because I have no knowledge of that. It's something for archaeologists to determine. And I think it's important that we don't replace the knowledge the archaeologist has here. It's something that can be annotated. <coughs> uh, rough, uh, computationally uh, viable annotations can be done, but when it comes to very specific annotations and landmarks that have to uh, that require knowledge of the piece, I think it's best left to the archaeologist to do it. I wouldn't dare go into that domain. Frank. Okay. Okay, there are some uh, questions here from the internet. Uh, yes, one is actually almost complementary to the one we just had. Uh, it's by Ella Andrews, and she's a conservator. Uh, she's working on a site, and half of a wall painting is on a wall, and the other half is in fragments, mm -hmm. uh, which have been excavated close by. Uh, however, they do not have the complete wall painting, and also the question is basically whether they, you could uh, reconstruct digitally based on the iconography on the surface of the fragments, mm -hmm. rather than the shape of the fragments themselves, since they are eroded and do not have hard breaks. So mm -hmm. I guess question is if you can combine, if you can combine, if there are methods of combining different lines of yes, data you, you there. Could, but it's an assumption. Obviously, when you extend a um, salient feature of the surface outside the domain of the surface, you assume that it's a continuous uh, line and it extends, it actually extends. So you have to have faith on that, okay. <laughs> obviously. Um, the farther away two pieces are, the harder it is to make this uh, assumption a valid one, obviously. Uh, with the exception of very uh, specific examples like here, where we know that if this um, wall, uh, a graved wall uh, uh, boundary on one piece, yes, it should continue at some point to the nearest possible fragment. But then again, if those two fragments are too remote and too far apart, you can say nothing about it. So they are unusable, actually. Um, so as far as the pieces are, can be considered uh, uh, to be belong to the same neighborhood, especially, yes, you can use those uh, features and uh, detect them and extend them and use them for matching. It has been done in the past and it's successful. Uh, but otherwise, no, I don't think if it's too, too far apart, no, these are, these are unreliable. And there is one more question, which is more technical. I mean, um, uh, it's from a, an anonymous attendee. Uh, an archaeologist is working in Cyprus, 
and he's uh, researching terracotta votive figurines, so I guess objects that are fairly small in size. Mm -hmm. So he's wondering what kind of technology would be available and would match uh, for digitizing, I guess, these artifacts in the field. Um, in the field? In the field as well. Oh. I think the, your best candidate would be photogrammetry. Here. Photogrammetry. Because uh, all the other technologies uh, are either in lab equipment, like micro CT, or you, they depend on the size of the object. And this kind of size is really not trackable. So photogrammetry, I think, is the best solution you could uh, hope for here. Do you have any other questions? I have a kind of a methodological, practical question, Yorgo. So you said that actually you don't need so much uh, detailed information of uh, the surfaces that actually you are not going to use for matching the object. So can you, is there a method or is there a possibility, let's say, to have uh, more precise, more accurate uh, scanning, uh, digitizing, or whatever, without whatever method of, at the same time probably, uh, of the surface that you are interested in, high resolution, and for the rest, at a low resolution, or I'm oh, okay. imagining things? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, most of the scanning technologies produce samples almost proportionally to the rate of sampling. So if you're intent on capturing some detail, a specific part of the geometry, you usually spend more time uh, probing that area. So this means that an expert user can actually afford more samples where they count or, and then go by quickly and sweep the, the entire rest of the surface. Um, there's no automated way to do that. The only thing that can be done is to, during capture, to remove points that, and recognize points that seem to be uh, not very useful, and just discard them, but you're going to capture them first, and then on runtime you may decide, okay, I can uh, make this part sparser, due to this morphology and uh, the uh, non-presence of important features. Uh, but otherwise, uh, for instance, photogrammetry works this way. Uh, photogrammetry doesn't produce point uh, clouds, with the, the same density for point clouds everywhere, because it doesn't emit, and it's not a structured light scanner, it doesn't produce the uh, salient features on the surface to capture them back and process them as point clouds. So it has to rely on uh, interesting bits on the surface. So a non-interesting flat surface will eventually produce less samples than one with an intricate detail or crack or fracture or some engraving on it. Uh, but this is specific to the photogrammetry method. Uh, however, it's a good candidate as a good uh, method for that kind of scanning, photogrammetry, because it intrinsically produces less information where there is no or few data to capture. That's what I would consider here. Any other question? Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I think we have to thank uh, George for his it's beautiful... It's a pleasure work. for me to be here. Thank you very much. And please join us for a drink downstairs to further discuss with Yorgos or between us <laughs> these interesting things. Thank you again for coming.